So we're getting pretty hungry here, so we're gonna need to look and see what is safe to eat. So there's a bunch of fish floating around here. There's a boomerang here. A herbivore encountered in large numbers, found to frequent shallow waters and move in schools. They have serrated teeth, suggests adaptation for grinding corals other herbivores are unable to digest. Twin fins. Unusually, this species' two fins are a cartilaginous extension of its skeleton. They are less prone to damage and provide superior propulsion, but are also harder to grow back. The bright blue tips are in fact the ends of its digestive tract, where the luminescence of the corals it consumes is most focused. Most active during daylight hours and prone to flee on approach, the boomerang can more easily be observed at night, when its luminescence gives it away as it seeks the shelter of the seabed. Assessment, edible. So we can see here at night, the boomerangs are pretty easy to spot. They're pretty luminescent. And they're available in large numbers thanks to being, you know, adapting to their environment, eating things no other creature can eat. That's Darwinism. We're also pretty thirsty, so we're gonna need to look around and see if there's anything we can drink. So there's a weird fish here called a bladder fish that we can scan. Bladderfish. This unusual herbivore appears to be mostly defenseless and bears little resemblance to other life forms around it. Semi-permeable bladder. The bladderfish is able to filter air and seawater into its body cavity through a unique membrane which surrounds its spine like a bladder. This allows it to remove and consume organic particulate caught on the way and adjust its buoyancy. Open-ended vascular tubing can be angled and contracted to pump out water and achieve I've died. <laughs> this is going well. <laughs> the Safe Shallows, uh, rather misleading name. There's still plenty things that can kill you here. So I'm gonna keep that in. Maybe I'll censor my horrific misuse of the English language. So we got poisoned there by a gasopod. So you wanna watch out for these guys for sure. It's nighttime, so they're a bit sleepy, but they can still really harm you. Gasopod, a slow moving life form and one of the larger herbivores on the planet. Providing a substantial meal to would be predators, the gasopod protects its domain by filling the surrounding water with poisonous and corrosive pods whose contents dissolve even synthetic fibers. So, our wetsuit's got nothing on these guys. Filtration system. Thick, non-reactive skin and multiple gill layers render this creature impervious to the noxious cloud acid clouds it produces. Algae gland, a bulbous sac-like appendage on the rear end. A luminescent yellow algae grows inside the sac and produces the poisonous compound. Abdominal muscles can contract, causing the algae gland to emit the noxious compound into the surrounding water. Barge pelvic fins capable of powerful movement through the water when moving in small herds. Behaviour. Gasopods appear to be social in nature and may even use their emissions in their relationship rituals. Their audible calls are likely signifiers of nearby threats or food sources. Assessment. Approach with caution. Acidic pods may be retrieved and repurposed. So we picked up a gas pod there. Detecting increased local radiation levels. Uh oh. Trend is consistent with damage to the Aurora's drive core sustained during planet fall. So we don't want to go near the Aurora just yet. Seems like there's some radiation there. We picked up a gas pod there, an acidic compound produced by the gasopod. Maybe repurposed. You want to hang on to these things just in case. So we were looking at the bladder fish before. Largely oblivious to threats, and practically immobile at night, its only identified defence mechanism is that it's composed almost entirely of water, air, and cartilage. Assessment, edible. Oxygen may be retrieved from the bladder and added to tanks on consumption. Membrane has applications as a natural water filter. So because this fish actually has oxygen in it, if we're underwater and we eat it, we'll get a little bit of oxygen from eating it. That's not how I would use them though. I would be turning them into water. But 
you know, if it's uh, between uh, <laughs> if it's between droning and not droning, always pick not droning. We also found a Gary fish. This guy here, this rather unusual looking fellow. Slow moving and cutious herbivore. Camouflage indicates adaptation for evasive behavior on the ocean floor. Eye stalks may be beneficial when watching for predators from hiding places amongst the coral. Behavior. More active during daylight hours, but slow and docile at all times, the gaddyfish's survival depends on a combination of camouflage and predators who can get a more fulfilling meal elsewhere. Assessment. Edible. It's a pretty fair assessment. Gaddyfish are alright, but if you're wanting a more fulfilling meal, I would definitely go for a peeper. The only problem with the peepers is they're quite fast and hard to catch. Let alone scan. Boom. Peeper! A fast prey fish encountered in shallow waters and rich with protein. Developed side facing eyes, capable of discerning colours not just in shallow waters but in a variety of lighting conditions. It's also able to close its eyelids, thus preventing light from reflecting off the lenses and rendering the peeper almost invisible to nighttime predators. Powerful fins. This species has evolved powerful fins which enable rapid acceleration in still water, and the ability to leap meters into the air to avoid pursuers. Beak. Likely used to break down corals and tough vegetation. An unusually large nasal cavity serves no obvious purpose and appears to be specifically evolved to detect a single, specific, enzyme. Nothing encountered on the planet so far produces a matching odour. Expulsion tubes. The tubes attached to the peeper's torso are connected directly to its stomach and gills and appear to be designed to expel its contents on demand. Purpose unclear. While the peeper is well adapted to survive in shallow waters, a number of its features serve no discernible purpose. It would appear to just be as well suited to survive in deeper waters and is somewhat more intelligent than the usual small herbivore. Assessment, edible, high calorie count, further research required. A lot of this will be very relevant later. Lastly, swimming around here in the shallow waters, we have a rabbit ray. These would be tasty if we could eat them. Rabbit ray, a herbivorous aquatic life form. Rabbit rays appear to live serene and solitary lives with few predators, a natural sense of curiosity and awesomely poisonous flesh. Darn, well that's that idea out the window. Ears. Twin orange appendages mounted on the head sense vibration in the water. Undulating wings. Markedly similar method of transportation to that of Earth rays. Zero genetic resemblance detected, suggesting these two species independently developed similar so solutions to their environmental circumstances. Evidence indicates its large side facing eyes are relatively recent adaptations. It's likely that there are related ray species in other environmental biomes on the planet. Assessment inedible but harmless and super cute to boot <laughs> ah what do we have here this is a mesmer now he's quite far away from home the mesmers that we find here near the safe shallows they're actually meant to be in the kelp forest they don't seem to be um, very aggressive, but we will come across more aggressive versions of these later on. So you're just going to have to subscribe and keep watching the playthrough because these little guys can be pretty funny. The fabricator cooks small organisms while disposing of the skeletal structure bodily fluids, and internal organs, thus rendering them safe for human consumption. It is common for those accustomed to synthetic foods to be repulsed by eating an animal carcass. Remember that humans survived this way for millennia. You can too. So I guess we're mainly used to synthetic foods in this sort of future world. However, I'm going to eat all these fish and I'm going to like it. Continued degradation of the Aurora's drive core may result in a quantum detonation. Continuing to monitor. A result in a quantum detonation. Sounds pretty likely to me. 
Aurora Ship Status. Ship Class Altera Long Range Capital Ship. Mission Ariane Arm Phase Gate Installation. Three Year Operation Time. Crew Command Team 23, Engineering Team 85, Support Crew 40, Passengers 9. Status Sustained heavy damage in orbit of Planet 4546b. Cause unknown. Evacuation data unavailable. Engineering section. Dark Matter Ion Drive Core V8. Manned Robotics Suite. Advanced Scanner Suite. Long Range Communications Relay. 0.25 cubic kilometers storage for phase gate apparatus. Habitation section. Accommodation for 150 people. Multiple canteens serving healthy, fresh and rehydrated food. Leisure facilities including VR suite and virtual cinema. Well, too bad it's now all useless to us. Or is it? Maybe we'll be able to go and check that out later. Aha! Salt. Culinary and sanitation applications. So we can use salt to cure fish. Normally cooked fish lasts... Local radiation readings suggest the Aurora's drive core has reached critical state. Quantum detonation will occur within two hours. Okay, so we want to make sure we are nowhere near that ship when that Life goes off. On this planet grows in unusually distinct and diverse ecological biomes. Further study recommended. Yeah, I'm working on that, Miss PDA lady. Definitely working on the study part. As I was saying, usually when you cook fish, it's got a limited lifespan, but if you cure it, it does sort of like, you know, you're not going to get as much food out of it because it's preserved in salt. Dehydrating but keeps well. Yeah, so it's going to go like, it's going to spoil much slower, but you want to make sure you have a bottle of water nearby if you're going to carry around cured fish. The medical kit fabricator here automatically makes a med kit every 15 minutes, so you want to make sure you're picking those up. See, look there, that'll go from 0 to 100%. Takes 15 minutes. Especially if you're exploring caves. <laughs> At the start of the game, our oxygen tank is pretty limited. In fact, we don't actually have an oxygen tank. We're limited purely on the size of our lungs, which is not very big. So you can, if you want, construct a floating air pump with some pipes to help you if you want to explore a little bit deeper. Air pumps can be used to pipe breathable air to a remote location. The base attached air pump can be built at a compatible habitat and will source oxygen directly from the habitat's oxygen regenerator. The floating air pump must have access to breathable air and be floating on the water's surface. Pumps must be connected to a pipe chain to function. So now we can more safely explore the caves. We're looking for cave sulfur, which, you know, funnily enough, from the name, we would assume that you find in caves. So there's not very much in this one, but we'll have another look elsewhere. If you don't have the resources to build a pipe network, you can always find one of these guys. If it'll let me scan it amidst the bubbles. This is a brain coddle. A permanent growing colony of microscopic organisms. This caudal species has adapted to filter carbon dioxide from the environment, using the carbon to build the colony and expelling the oxygen from specialized exhaust funnels. It's quite hardy, suggesting samples from a mature specimen could be grown artificially. Assessment: Air tanks are equipped to siphon oxygen from the water where possible. So we can sit here and get some oxygen while we get our bearings. Okay, we have another cave system in here. Looks like it might have what we need in it. Ah, it does! It does! Rah! <laughs> well, that was a crash fish. Uh, it's really hard to avoid that explosion area of effect when you don't have any fins. Um, yeah. Those are crash fish and they're found in caves in the safe shallows. They make a little bed. Oh, for goodness sake! Ah! <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why we're here. We're here for sulfur. So we've got these little... Where are you? Let's see if we can scan him. 
Damn it! Didn't even get the scan! This is the best. It's the best tutorial ever. <laughs> right, okay, so yeah, we have our cave sulfur here that we're gonna pick up. The sulfur plant where the crash fish lives. Right here, these plants appear to serve as nests for the explosive organisms which guard them. The outer petals are undamaged by the presence of the inhabiting creature, suggesting a complex co-development. The plant has evolved to feed on nutrients and minerals deposited within it by the fish. Sulfuric deposits by the inner leaves provide an insight into the mechanism by which these creatures explode. Assessment. Sulfur has applications in construction of the repair tool. There's something quite curious about the crash fish because they literally spend so much time in these plants that they've sort of evolved like the ability to, well, it, it's sulfur, it's gunpowder, but they explode. <laughs> and that's their way of warding off predators. So I would love to be able to scan one, maybe if I don't die. There's a creature egg here. Um, alien eggs. If evidence suggests that a substantial number, if not all, of the local species reproduce through egg laying. Eggs can be found resting on the seafloor, buried beneath detritus, or even wedged into cracks in the rock. Different species likely favour different biomes as their nesting grounds. Eggs discovered in the wild are in some form of natural stasis. Survivor, you have exceeded your weekly exercise quotient by 500%. Data indicates that swimming was your favorite activity. Be sure to vary your routine for uniform muscle development. Don't skip arm day, my dude. Likely awaiting ideal conditions in which to hatch, or the delivery of some vital enzyme which will kickstart the process. It's impossible to calculate the species of the egg from the exterior. However, it may be possible to stimulate a hatching response if an egg is relocated to a suitable alien containment unit. So we will get the ability later on in the game to hatch these eggs. And I don't know what the PDA is on about. These eggs look very distinctively different. And I know for a fact this one is a crash fish egg. I'm wanting a crash fish though. I want some sandstone. <gasps> There's one. Yay! He got stuck. Works for me. Works for me. <laughs> so crash fish are carnivores. This unusual species has developed an emergency defense mechanism based on mutually assured destruction. <laughs> Forward mounted eye enables the creature to identify and track potential predators. Sulfur plant. The sulfur plant has evolved to feed on sulfuric compounds secreted by the crash fish, which makes its nest within its leaves. Stronger, more protective plants provide superior nesting grounds, which in turn provide the plant with more nutrients from larger crash fish. Defense mechanism. Concentrations of sulfur build up in the organism over time. If the crash fish collides with something at sufficient speed, the spikes on its torso are impacted, triggering an explosive chemical reaction. Assessment. Equip a stasis rifle, repulsion cannon, or similar before approaching shallow caves. So crash fish are found in shallow caves, as we have discovered. And we can get sulfur from their nests because they just poop them out. They just poop out that sulfur. Uh, also found in caves, we have shuttle bugs. These little squiddy doos. The shuttle bug is a common scavenger at the base of the food chain. Mouth parts small enough to be of little threat to most organisms. This creature is clearly adapted to feed on the waste products of the ecosystem around it. Three mandibles used to orient themselves when drifting and to filter through detritus on cave floors. Three legs, high strength muscles can propel the life form great distances through the water, as well as ambulating them across the sea floor. Assessment. Necessary waste recycler. Presence may indicate nearby cave systems. So if you find one of these outside, like look around, there will definitely be a cave somewhere nearby. There's caves all over the planet. And these can help you find them. We've got a little pipe system here, but if we didn't, um, you can get in a lot of trouble really easily, even in the shallow caves. What's oh, a whole fish here? We haven't found one of these yet. Whole fish, a very small herbivore found in small numbers, often around cave system entrances where their skin coloration blends into the background. Bored out tail fin. By manipulating the size and shape of the hole in its tail, it can perform unpredictable maneuvers. 
size, smaller than most other herbivores, presumably due to lack of vegetation in low light environments. Assessment, edible. So we'll probably continue to find these as we dive deeper and deeper down. So over here we have a new outcrop. Sandstone. These common potus outcrops seem to form around small amounts of precious metals, or otherwise these metals are part of a sedimentary buildup over time. Assessment. Lead, silver, or gold source. So, gold there. Where'd my pipes go? So we got some gold for that one, but you can get silver and lead from them too. So that means finding them this early is pretty cool. Don't know what's happened to my game sound. There we go. Yeah, so silver you can use to make wiring kits. Safe shallows at night are maybe, it's maybe like my favorite thing in the world. I, I just, I can't describe the feeling I get when I just see glow in the dark mushrooms, man. <laughs> it just makes me so happy. <laughs> Unfortunately, LifePod 5 doesn't have a little bed for us, so we're just gonna have to, like, endure through the evening. We can make some glass with this quartz that we found. It's always a good idea to make everything that you can make at least once, because then you might, like, learn to make something else. So something that we should have done a really long time ago actually in this playthrough, but I got a bit distracted looking for food, you know, as you do, you know, thinking of my stomach first, you know, it's a girl thing, I don't know, uh, is we should have built an O2 tank. So like up till now we've been surviving just on the strength of our lungs, which is not very strong, but with just three pieces of titanium that you can easily get by breaking down some metal salvage, you can get yourself a tank. So we've picked up the blueprint through making the normal oxygen tank for the high capacity O2 tank. So we'll want to look for some more quartz to make more glass so we can have an even bigger tank. Get your cell a battery and some glass and you can make a flashlight, which will make exploring at night a little bit more beatable. And it's never a bad idea to build a little locker to keep some metals in. Just while you're waiting on your habitat builder to build your base. My wee lock. It won't let me call it my wee locker day. But hey. So we'll just put all the stuff in here. So along the way, obviously, the Aurora was a big hacking ship. So we're going to find a lot of wreckage. So let's see if there's anything we can salvage in here. Fifty percent done of the sea glide fragment scan, so if we find another one of them, we can build a sea glide. Also, we have a trash can here. <gasps> uh oh. Oh god. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. 